The House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. So now for um, the people that don't know who you are, let's let's talk a little bit about you and where you came from and what brought you into writing about this uh, um, mysterious death of Diana. Yeah, okay, well, I'm actually a New Zealander. I was uh, born in New Zealand. I've been in Australia, though, for about um, something like 26 years. And I, uh, I, I got interested in the case of Princess Diana's death after uh, Paul Burrell, her butler, wrote a book uh, in 2003 in which he uh, published a uh, note from Diana that predicted that she could um, die in a car crash, an orchestrated car crash. And um, so that when I saw that handwritten note, which was published in the newspapers around the world, I thought, well, that's very interesting that uh, she predicted that. She actually wrote it in October 1995, and then within two years... Um, Within two years of that, she uh, she actually did die, and also in the same myth which she had predicted in the in the note. So that that was a very significant little piece of um, evidence, I thought. And anyway, I I uh, I actually remember cutting that out of one of the newspapers here, and then a few years later, or a couple of years later. Uh, I was in, uh, I'd, I'd actually come down with a very severe illness and I had to retire. And in uh, 2005, I was looking at what I could do and I decided I could write. And so I was looking uh, at what I'd write about and I, I figured out that that could be worth me doing some research on that um, crash. So, so that's what I um, did and then by uh, um, 2006, when the police investigation was completed in December 2006, I'd already done about 18 months of research on the um, crash, so I was starting to get a picture of what had taken place. And, and then when the police uh, did, um, did their pageant report, which they put out on the internet, I printed it off and read through it, 800 pages of the budget report. I, I then realised that the police investigation had not really been a, an investigation into determining what happened, but instead they were more interested in appearing to cover up. There was just so many errors in that report, and I, I realised that when I started reading because I already knew a fair bit about it. So I, so I then, I was in the process at that stage of writing a book on the death of Diana and I actually ended up changing it to a book on the Padgett Report. And so I, I wrote a book called Cover Up of a Royal Murder, Hundreds of Errors in the Padgett Report. And that book got published um, in the same month that the inquest started. So the, so the police investigation was completed December 2006 and the inquest started Ten months later, in October 2007, and in the intervening period, I completed the book and had it published in that month that the inquest started, and that was that book was distributed um, by Muhammad Al Fayed to um, the lawyers at the inquest, and they uh, they I've had feedback from lawyers saying that they used that book uh, during the inquest, and so then when the inquest started and went on for six months that the, the transcripts were downloaded on the or uploaded onto the internet every day and I um, was downloading them here and uh, reading through the inquest as it happened and so I was very interested in the inquest because I was thinking well the Padgett and the police investigation have been so corrupted and I sort of thought well now we've got a jury so how is this going to work that they how are they going to get this through? So, so I studied the transcripts and uh, I ended up writing a series of books. I've written six volumes, a series of each aspect of the case um, based on 
what was the inquest um, transcripts, but also based on the well, it's on that Paget report, and also in 2010 I um, received a huge batch of documents uh, that were from within the British Police investigation, and they, they were very critical documents to the case, and none of them were shown to the jury. And so I produced a book called um, Diana and Chris, the, doc the documents the jury never saw. Uh, and I published those documents, and amongst those documents are things like the, the uh, post-mortem reports for Princess Diana and Dodie Poet, which none of which were shown to the jury, even though they were investigating the cause of death, they were not shown the post-mortem reports. I produced the six volumes on, on the Diana inquest, and uh, so basically, the one, one of the things that was interesting about the inquest was that uh, the verdict of the jury was quite different to what the uh, police investigation had had um, th concluded. Like the, initially, there was a French investigation, police investigation that started on the day of the crash, and in 1999 they produced a result that stated the. Uh, crash was caused by a driver who was drunk, being Henry Paul, the driver of the Mercedes, who was drunk. And then in the British investigation, like I said, finished in 2006, their, um, their, their uh, conclusion was that the crash was caused by a um, driver who was speeding and influenced by drink. So very, very similar finding to the French police investigation. And then uh, when the jury produced their verdict, it was quite different. Their verdict was unlawful killing by the driver of the Mercedes, but also by following vehicles which were um, identified following vehicles. And it can be shown that they were not paparazzi uh, who, were, who were riding scooters and driving cars, so they were not the following vehicles that the jury were talking about, and that's why they were unidentified. So their finding was unlawful killing by, by these following vehicles and the driver, so quite different to what the police had concluded. So in, in effect, the, the establishment didn't really get it completely past the jury, even though the true finding would have been murder. That verdict was withheld by the coroner, so the jury could not find for murder. So they would have, if they thought murder, then they would have had to decide it was an open verdict. The jury was not unanimous. There was nine to two. So the two people who who didn't conclude unlawful killing may have concluded murder. Uh, you just don't know. Right. But, well, do you, so when you say um, cover up and stuff on the police, so do you think they intentionally covered it up, or was it just really bad police work? Oh, no, it was intentionally covered up. I think uh, one of the things that, if you're in the study into the way the patch was done, uh, there, there's elements of them trying to find the truth, and, and I think it, what it is, it's the lower-level officers that were working on the case. Some of them were genuinely interviewing witnesses and genuinely trying to establish what occurred. So the, the Paget report's a very strange document because it's a mix of that there's a mix of that, so in the, in the Paget report, there's quite a bit of evidence that indicates murder. Um, but the conclusions drawn by the Paget report are that it was an accident uh, caused by the drunk driver. So, uh, yeah, so, so it's sort of a bit of a mix, but the overall thing is that the police at the top were covering up, so they, they had to reach a conclusion that um, was not murder, and so so that's what happened. But the yeah, it's interesting how that that Patrick puts out. It's full of this stuff that indicates murder, and they draw these conclusions of um, an accident. So it's quite easy to when I did my book to show okay, well this evidence is indicating murder. This is in the Patrick court, and yet they conclude this, and it's just a complete contradiction to what the evidence was very, very strange for. 
Mm. And, and so how was it for you when you were investigating and researching all the different books you've done? Uh, how was it with you? Like, how were the police toward you and how were um, just general people when you were trying to investigate or research? Oh, uh, well, um, I've had people that have helped me, uh, mainly people in the UK who, um, and mainly people that want to remain anonymous. But the... Uh, you know, like I said, those um, those documents. I mean, that, that when I received that batch of documents that the jury never saw, well, that really uh, that that really made an impact on my investigation, and so that that really helped me immensely. So I've had sort of uh, support like that. I, I haven't really had any direct um, sort of any direct overtures from the uh, establishment um, that against me although there's a lot of indirect stuff on the internet and I was also I've had interference in various ways with my work but nothing direct you know that you could sort of say well, this, per- this person's given me a death threat or anything like that So now let's start with um, what, what happened now, so do you think that the accident was all pre it was kind of predetermined like they kind of planned um, the accident? Yeah, it was a planned operation. But what happened is they knew they had the... They were, uh, Diana was under surveillance, so they were monitoring her phone and, that, and she was in... Uh, um, she was travelling around off Dodie and various uh, trips that she was making. And anyway, there was a phone call that um, Dodie fired her lover. He... He made a phone call to uh, the uh, Ritz in Paris, uh, which is, was owned by his father, and he made that phone call on the 18th of uh, August 1997. So that was two weeks before the death, and during that phone call, it was clear from anyone monitoring it, and there's no doubt Dodie, Dodie was, would have been, Dodie's phone calls would have been monitored as well as dying. There was a very clear statement that um, they they would be travelling to Paris uh, at the end of August. So basically, they had anyone um, doing the operation, which was um, the evidence indicates the NY6. They were aware that the couple would be travelling to Paris at the end of August. So they had two weeks basically to to organise the detail of what they were going to do. And uh, so, yeah, it's an extremely well-planned operation. I think it was done with the help of the French intelligence and also the CIA. So uh, the yeah, you can see the evidence of planning right through the operation, you know, like the things like the... They, uh, there's evidence of uh, how they were going to even cover it up. So they already knew in advance what they were going to do to cover it up. Things like the nailing it on the paparazzi and also on the truck driver. So the uh, if you if you walk down the streets of London and, and ask start asking people um, who killed. Diana, a lot of people will say the paparazzi, or even anyone that you ask them in Australia or the US, they'll say the paparazzi. Uh, they were chasing her to her death, you know. And then the the other thing they might say, well, look, the, the driver, uh, because he was drunk. So there's just two things, and that that line is in a lot of people's minds, even though they're both are, uh, erroneous. But they're in they're in people's minds as the cause of the crash. So th- these things were worked out before the crash even occurred, and you can see the evidence of it. And things like uh, the uh, Henry Paul, who was working for intelligence, even though he had no idea of what he was involved, and in, he had no idea that they were about to kill Diana. He probably thought they. The things he was doing for the intelligence would be helping to protect. But one of the things he did was uh, 
and he was paid very well. There's a lot of money that went into his accounts that was unaccounted for and in, in investigations. And um, one of the things he was doing was that at the hotel in the night, he was making regular trips out to the paparazzi. Now, he was the acting head of security for the hotel, so, they, so, so they, they, they basically don't interact with the paparazzi, these guys, because they, the hotel is about securing the uh, well-being of the, of the guests and uh, Diana and Dodie were VIP guests and yet Henry Paul was going out to the paparazzi and telling them oh they're going to be out in about 15 minutes they're going to be out in 10 minutes and as it got later in the night he, he went out there more you know, he made about 5 trips in total to, to the paparazzi out the front of the hotel telling them they're not going to be very long and uh so why does anyone do that? I mean, you'd be doing the opposite if you were uh, interest, in, had the interests of the couple who um, who weren't interested in being hounded by the paparazzi. So, so the reason that he was doing it was to make sure the paparazzi didn't go home because they, they once they got to eleven o'clock or tw- towards twelve o'clock, you know, it'd be easy for the paparazzi to think, oh well. They're going to be staying in the hotel overnight. There's no point in waiting out here. So, so he was making sure they were staying, and he was being paid to do that. So, so then when the when the Mercedes did leave the hotel, the paparazzi was still there, and they followed the Mercedes. And uh, like I said before, they were on uh, scooters and uh, and in small cars, and they, they once it became a chase. Uh, once we got onto the expressway heading towards the Allen Tunnel, well, the paparazzi had no chance of keeping up because um, they just didn't have the power in the vehicles they were in. And the witnesses who, who saw what happened on the expressway, they all say that they saw several motorbikes um, surrounding the Mercedes, and these are large um, dark motorbikes with um, a couple of billions of passengers on. So, so these um, these motorbikes also were taking flash photos, uh, and as, as the car um, headed towards the Alma Tunnel, so uh, they were basically what I call fake paparazzi. They were pretending to be paparazzi. So, so this was the whole thing. That the paparazzi were there at the hotel. They followed the Mercedes. The people saw motorbikes surrounding the Mercedes. The people who saw the motorbikes probably thought they were paparazzi as well. But the fact is that the paparazzi are accounted for on the night and they were not riding these motorbikes. So, so then uh, you, you've got to say, well, who was riding them? And one of the aspects of that is that, that none of these riders on these motorbikes have ever been identified. And, and even when the jury found for unlawful killing by following vehicles, which was specific in the motorbikes. That's what they were talking about. These people on the motorbikes that the witnesses saw, several, several witnesses had different um, accounts, but they all saw a cluster of motorbikes around the Mercedes. The, these, um, the, the, the jury verdict was unlawful killing by the, those motorbikes, and yet, um, after the inquest was completed, there was then no attempt by any of the authorities in France or the UK to establish the identity of those motorbikes. So if that had been a normal person who had died and it had been established that they had been forced into the crash through uh, surrounding motorbikes and there was a, also a flash, a stroke like flash to, to the driver inside the tunnel. Um, yeah, if that had been a normal person that was done to, then immediately concluding an inquest that decided that the uh, that, that these motorbikes were um, the cause of the crash and they were unidentified, and immediately following that, there would be a police investigation set up to establish who those motorbike riders were, and that never occurred. So uh, it's all part of the cover-up. A lot of things are about what didn't happen, you know, and that's a, that's a thing that didn't happen. The police never lifted a finger to find out who was riding on those motorbikes. Well, was there a detail, like, um, 
there to protect uh, Diana? Because, like, you know, in, in the U.S. they have um, Secret Service, and even on old leaders or people that are no longer in power, they still have Secret Service following them. So it, does England have the same? The royals do, but Diana wasn't a royal at the time of her death, so she had been removed from the royal family by the Queen a year earlier. And also on top of that, even when she was a royal, in 1994 she had requested that her police um, guard be withdrawn. So she was no longer under day-to-day bodyguard um, sort of protection from the police after, uh, I think it was late 1994. So, yeah, that was one of the aspects of the case was the, the police said, well, if, um, if we had been protecting her, this would not have happened. You've also mentioned about the, they're in the uh, crash, and uh, I know you talked about um, the post-crash medical treatment of Diana. Yeah. So it, yeah. w- it wasn't very good or deliberate? She, um, she survived the crash. So what happened is when the crash occurred, it, it crashed into the 13th pillar of the tunnel head on at 60 mile an hour. And the two people that were on the uh, driver's side, the, the front, the driver in the front, and then Dodie Fred in the back, he was on the driver's side. Both of them died instantly. And the two people on the passenger side, which was Trevor East Jones, who was in the front of the bodyguard, he, he's still alive. And uh, Princess Diana in the back, she survived as well. So both of those people on the passenger side survived. And so when the... Uh, the way this occurred was the, the medical treatment and the ambulance was really the thing that really took her life because um, what occurred was firstly uh, when people um, people rang in to the base so immediately after the crash 12.23am the phone calls coming into Sami which is the ambulance base headquarters in Paris and uh, so the, the, uh, there's two people in the base, um, that, that run the base, two, two doctors that run the base overnight in Paris and there was, uh, one of them was asleep and the other one was Dr. Arno de Rossi and he was taking the calls and then he allocated, uh, an ambulance to that crash which was, um, Dr. Jean Marc Martino and he allocated that ambulance and then so what happened is Martino uh, travelled to the crash and he didn't arrive until 12.40, so he arrived 17 minutes after the crash. Now, the, the ambulance left from the NECA hospital, which was the base hospital, and it was 2.3 kilometres from the crash. And so they took a hell of a long time to get to the crash. In actual fact, when you, when you go through the transcripts, you work out the time that the ambulance left, which was 12.27, uh, so it's four minutes after the crash, and it took 13 minutes to travel 2.3 kilometres, so it was travelling at an average of 11.5 kilometres an hour, which in the US would be at 7 miles per hour. So, so it was travelling very, very slowly. I think what happened is it might have been travelling fast, but it stopped um, at some point on the way, probably for instructions. And, what, and you've got to understand that, that uh, intelligence agencies use people as agents to, to do their work and they use people from all sorts of um, walks of life so you, people can have a career as a doctor but also be working as an agent it could be your next door neighbour you just don't know but there are that, that, that's how they operate so so the people have a normal job and then, and then they'll be also working for intelligence as a part time and they'll get a lot of money for what they do so, as it turns out, what happened is that ambulance arrived at the crash scene and immediately it arrived, Martino called the base and he spoke to De Rossi and said we're here and, um, and he, there was, the transcript of the call was uh, shown at the inquest and he, he said that about the, the number of people in the car and that sort of thing. And then immediately after that call, De Rossi left the base and headed straight to the crash scene. He, he left so quickly he didn't even wake up the other doctor. 
So it was left to an auxiliary to wake up uh, the other doctor, which was Dr. Mark Rudeau. Now, when you piece all the evidence together, what happens is that De Rossi, who was manning the phones at the base, and Martino were both working for intelligence. So when De Rossi got to the question, you then had two doctors there working for intelligence. And what occurred was that it took them one hour, 43 minutes to deliver Diana to the hospital. So there was a very long period of time when she was in near care. And uh, people sort of, uh, like at the inquest, one of the issues was that all well, the system in Paris is different. And, and it is. It is different. It's true. Um, like in the US, what happens is um, they call it scoop and run. And so when a, when a um, person is in a car crash and injured, the ambulance will rush to the scene and pick up the, um, pick up the uh, victim and rush them to the hospital. And then in Paris and in France, what they have is a system called stay and play. And they, so they have ambulances that have a doctor on board, which generally in the US and certainly here in Australia, they don't have a doctor on board the ambulance. But in Paris they do. And uh, they have more equipment on the ambulance, so what they call stay and play. So what they do is they ambulance arrives at the crash scene and then tries to stabilise the patient um, and then takes them to hospital. And they will do more at the scene than than what they would in, in uh, the other sort of Western countries. But but the thing is that even in even in France. There are times when they will still rush a person to hospital. And it depends on what the injuries are, what the perception of the injuries are. So if you've got a patient um, who is in Diana's situation, and Diana's situation was very interesting because when, when they first tested her on what they call the um, Glasgow Coma scale, um, she, she registered 14 out of 15. This was done in the car while she was still in the car. Um, she registered 14 out of 15, and that's basically an assessment of her condition in her head. And that's something that's used around the world. It's the Glasgow Kona. And so uh, that meant that she was in, uh, considering what she'd been through, she had been in a 60-mile-an-hour car crash uh, and wasn't wearing a seatbelt. So her body was swung around 180 degrees and she was left with her uh, on the floor of the back. So her back was against the, the back of the front seat and her legs were up on the, uh, on the back seat. So she, she'd been through a very severe crash and yet she came out 14 out of 15. So she did, she came out extremely well. But the thing is that doctors knew that if you're in a high speed, crash like that, there could be some sort of internal injury and then when they eventually and everything took a long time with this they, they took 20 minutes from when the ambulance arrived to get her to get her out of the car and then she got into the ambulance at 106 so <coughs> 106 is already sort of um, 43 minutes after the crash anyway, once in the ambulance they've got the records there they, external, they, they externally assess her uh, examine her and they in the records there it says uh, they saw a thoracic trauma so so they saw bruising from uh, in the chest um, and that's shown that there had been a thoracic trauma now once they saw that they knew that it could well be some sort of internal thoracic injury that, that means that okay there could be a torn vein and as it turned out there was a torn pulmonary vein that the blood pressure had dropped the blood pressure was down to um, <clears throat> 70 but which is still it's not it's not catastrophic but it is low so they they knew by that stage that she had an injury which they could not tell from the ambulance and that's the issue the issue is where can this patient be helped and there's a certain thing known as the golden hour in um, medical uh, circles and that's an hour that you get where you just have to do something if it's a serious um, injury. And this um, this was a serious injury. 
even though she scored so well on the Glasgow Karma, she still had a life-threatening situation. So they, when you look at the transcripts for the base, the base is asking uh, the ambulance, well, when are you leaving? What, when is the ambulance going? You know, and they stayed in the tunnel. The ambulance stayed in the tunnel for one hour and one minute. So it was... So it didn't leave until um, sort of 40, something like 41, so one, 141, so it was one hour and 18 minutes after the crash until the ambulance left the tunnel. So, but the base was concerned that the ambulance um, hadn't left, you know, and you can see that from the transcripts. And, the, and one of the other thing you can see from the transcripts is that De Rossi, who's the one phoning the base, says nothing for the thorax. And he says it twice to the base that there's nothing for the thorax. Now, that's a direct lie because he knew, because they'd done the examination, that there was a thoracic trauma. So so he knew there was something to do with the thorax, and yet he said nothing for the thorax. And to the base, and what that establishes is that when the ambulance finally arrives at the hospital, that they won't, be, they won't have a cardiothoracic expert on hand um, to deal with Diana. So, and, and that's exactly what happened. By, by the time the ambulance got to the hospital, the cardiothoracic surgeon was at home in bed. Well, that, if they had told them the base, OK, there's a thoracic trauma, then the base would have told the hospital, oh, you need a thoracic expert there, um, there's a trauma, you know. And so, so it was a sort of, there's a combination of things. They, the other thing is they... They were pouring in these um, what's called catecholamines, which is something that increases the blood pressure. Now the blood pressure was 70; it wasn't, and, they, and the inquest expert, the cardio expert at the inquest, said, "Well, with a blood pressure of 70, you wouldn't be, and, and the thoracic trauma, you wouldn't be putting in these catecholamines because what they do is they increase the blood pressure, but they also uh, will increase the pressure on any injury inside." The body, so so the so if there is a tear in a vein, then it's going to just increase the blood that's coming up, that's leaking from that. So so that these are very serious things because they started pouring these catecholamines, and then they did it over a very long period because it took a hell of a long time to get to the hospital. So so then the other aspect is that um, just before they got to the hospital, they stopped the ambulance stopped. And uh, there was two journalists who witnessed it. They they witnessed a rocking ambulance, and they also witnessed a doctor getting out of the front of the ambulance into the back. So they already had three people in the back. They had the doctor, and they had two interns, uh, student interns. And then they the fourth person came out of the front into the back. So they ended up with four people in the back of Diana. And this is just near the hospital gates, 500 yards from the hospital gates. They never gave a uh, credible explanation for why they stopped the ambulance. And that stopped for five minutes. And so the journalists saw a rocking ambulance. And so then you ask, well, what were they doing? You know, and inside the ambulance they said that they weren't doing a cardiac massage. They said that um, they'd stuck, that Martino said he stopped the ambulance so that he could increase her fluids because he thought she might have a cardiac arrest. Uh, so she didn't have a cardiac arrest at that stage. But then when she did get to the hospital, um, well, she only survived for another six minutes. So so she had already survived the one hour 43 minutes, and then she survived another six minutes, and then she stopped breathing. And uh, We at Wondery, creators of Dr. Death, Scamfluencers, and Over My Dead Body, go deeper into complex true crime stories to give you an inside look at the facts. And now we're launching the ultimate true crime fan destination, Exhibit C. It's truly criminal. Wondery's Exhibit C gives you the detective's lens of all of the evidence, taking you step by step through the twists and turns of each true crime case. Join the Exhibit C online community to access exclusive show merchandise, member-only content, and to hear directly from top criminal and social justice experts, witnesses, and investigators as they take us beyond the evidence and into the case file. Join now by following Wondery Exhibit C on Facebook or find us on the web at WonderyExhibitC.com and listen to true crime podcasts on Wondery and Amazon Music. 
Exhibit C. It's truly criminal. Uh, and she never got her breath back, so that was the, her life ended six minutes after arriving at the hospital. So then the focus must be on, okay, what was done in the ambulance? Um, you know, why did, why did she die straight after she arrived at the hospital? So now the other people in the car, so now uh, I noticed there was, you know, the, the bodyguard, Trevor Reese Jones, and he survived, but now he's claiming he had no memory of anything. <laughs> Yeah, yeah and, that's and 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 then he also ended up having a separate relationship with his boss, which was Alfie-eyed, right? Yes, that's right. And yeah. uh, so did did you ever get to talk to him or see anything dealing with him? And what did he ever change his statement? Oh yeah, he's changed his statement. Um, he, he's changed his statement a few times. Uh, his his evidence is very um, sort of. Can't rely on them. Um, I, I think that there's issues with the bodyguards, both him and Kez Winkfield, who was a bodyguard as well at the hotel. Uh, he actually went. They had a de- what they call a decoy plan um, that they put in force so that Diana and Dodie travelled in uh, a separate Mercedes, different to the one they'd been using through the day, and they left from the rear of the hotel where the the main Mercedes was out the front. So they used it as a decoy uh, to put off the paparazzi. Uh, Trevor East Jones and Piers Winfield, they both lied repeatedly on different issues. Uh, they have a, they had to sort of protect their reputations as bodyguards because, see, what happened at the hotel is that um, Henry Paul uh, had a couple of Rickards, which was an alcoholic drink, um, and... Um, in the hotel, in the sort of couple of hours leading up to the crash, so he, he wasn't he, he he wasn't over the limit. He had he had enough in those two records. I think I've forgotten what his uh, BAC would have been, his blood alcohol concentration, but it was nowhere near the limit. Um, in France, the limit's 0.5, not 0.5, but. Um, but they, the, the thing is that it was alcohol. He did have a couple of drinks, so and they were there when he had the drinks. He was at, sitting at the same table as him. So, so basically, the situation is that he shouldn't have been allowed to drive the car because once they knew that he was drinking alcohol, then the bodyguard should have said, "Okay, what well, do you can't drive the car?" Now they never did that. Uh, the uh, so. The, the whole idea of Henry Paul driving a car is unusual anyway because he had never actually driven guests at any time in his 11 years at the hotel. So this was the first time he ever drove any guests. Um, well, actually, from the when he, he went out to the airport that day as well, that was the first time he, he drove um, for the hotel. And, and, that, and then the, the, the trip into the tunnel... When they had the crash, that was the first time he drove uh, guests because he had Dinah and Jody in the car um, on that trip. But it was on the trip from the airport. He only had the luggage and the other people who were not guests in the hotel. So they basically knew that Henry Paul was drinking alcohol. So they didn't have to say in their police statements that they thought he was drinking. They called it pineapple juice or pineapple cordial. Um, and... They, they, so they were sort of, they were, they were lying because they knew that he was drinking alcohol. But they, the thing is, if they had admitted that they knew he was drinking alcohol, then they would have lost their careers because they, they shouldn't have let anyone who had been drinking alcohol drive the couple. Now, I'm not saying that, that the alcohol that Henry Paul drank really affected his judgment to that extent because, I mean, that's why they have the limit. So if you go over the limit, okay, there can be a chance that it's affecting your judgment. The, the, the implication is if you're under the limit, then basically you should be able to drive. So, but the thing is, because he was a chauffeur, then that's different. It puts him in a different situation as far as the bodyguards are concerned, you know, so they shouldn't let him drive. Now, these guys have lied to protect themselves. Uh, and uh, so... 
yeah, Trevor Rhys Jones was part of that. So I think I haven't actually studied into the amnesia aspect yet. That's one of the things I still have to do. Uh, there's still another volume still got to come out on this, but the uh, the indication is that he may well have not lost this memory because if there was a bit of evidence from one of the you know, housekeepers at the uh, Alfred Apartments in um, Park Lane in London and she said that she had spoken to Trevor East and he had told her not too long after the crash that if, he, if his memory came back that he would be in trouble so hmm. he, he may have been forced to be silent Right, and so now he worked for um, Dodi Fayad's, Fayad's dad, right, Al Fayad hmm. and so and Henry Paul, the driver you were talking now, so he worked for the hotel then yeah, well, Henry Paul worked for the hotel, but the hotel was owned by Alfred, so oh, okay. he also worked for Alfred. <laughs> so they're all in it. So now his family seems to be happy that they that they're probing this a lot because they don't think it was an accident either, do they? Actually, yeah, well, that's right. No, no, that they both think that there's more to it. Yeah, that's right. They they have a different angle. Um, the Henry Paul's family because they say, well. There's no way he had he worked for intelligence for. I mean, the, the evidence that Henry Paul worked for intelligence is very strong. Uh, the, the, um, but they are in denial over that. Well, that's understandable. I mean, it's their kid, so they wouldn't necessarily want it acceptable. It's not acceptable to them that he was working for intelligence, basically. Whereas I think Al Fayed accepts that he was even though he was an employee. But it's, sta- it's pretty standard, actually, that in um, these high-class hotels that the security department, there'll be people in the security department that are working for intelligence because intelligence has an interest in people who visit high-class hotels. Right. So, um, yeah, so that's pretty... That's not really a shock. But no. Because yeah. they Paul have connections with intelligence. But now the level of in- involvement and the money that he was getting, there was big money he was receiving. He was receiving much more than his Fritz wage each year from intelligence, and, and that's in his bank accounts. He had 17 bank accounts, um, and he had contacts, he had intelligence contacts in his phone diary. So he, he was definitely working for intelligence. And, and so now with all the cover-up, the French cover-up and the British and the corruption of Scotland Yard, so who do you think is behind everything? Like, who's, who, who's the one that wanted her dead? Well, the, the evidence indicates that there's two motives. Uh, firstly, there was her involvement in the uh, anti-landmines campaign. So she was revving that up. She had been to Angola in January 97, and then in February 97, uh, she received a death threat over the phone from the person who was the Minister of Armed Forces, in um, the UK, Nicholas Soames, he, he phoned her in February 97 and said to her um, that she should lay off the landmines campaign and uh, that accidents, he said an accident can happen, something along those lines. So, so basically she received a death threat from him and then actually in August she went on another visit this time to Bosnia uh, and that was in the same month she died. So and that was all part of her anti-landmines campaign. She gave a major speech about landmines in June 1997. The fact is that Diana was a humanitarian and she um, would have been moving on to other weapons. I don't think she, if she had won on landmines and got them completely banned, then she would have moved on to something else, you know, like cluster bombs or whatever. You know, so, so she was a real threat to the arms industry. And the other motive particularly her involvement with Muhammad al Um Muhammad al was actually a long-term family friend of her father and, uh, and the family. And um, then in uh, June 1997, he offered for her to have a holiday at his villa in the south of France, and, and she accepted that. But it wasn't just her that was going to be going on this holiday. She was going to be taking uh, Prince William and Prince Harry. Now, Prince William, of course, was a good king of England. So, basically, 
And this was a very bad, if you, if you sort of, uh, I don't know if bad's the right move, but it was a move that, uh, caused, um, concern in, in the establishment, um, British establishment. And this is because Muhammad al fayed was looked on as a man of ill repute. And, and he had, he had actually only just in that early in the year, he had been involved and the cash for questions scandal, which actually helped bring down conservative government in the UK in May 1997. So, so he was uh, looked on as being quite quite involved as a responsible party in the change of government. And the senior royals always had a hand in this. And what happened is um, that there was a period of time from 1992 when. Uh, Diana was um, causing trouble for the Queen and for the, for the senior royal family. And back in 1992, what happened was uh, she had been involved in a collaboration with Andrew Morton in a book uh, called um, Diana, Her True Story, I think. And anyway, it was published in about June 1992. At any royal reading it, um, knew that she was involved even though she wasn't her name wasn't sort of in there as a collaborator it was obvious that um, she was collaborating and she had provided information that, about the uh, inside workings of royal her mistreatment by royals that sort of thing was in the book so that really upset uh, Queen Philip and others and and she received some very strong letters from Philip um, immediately following it. Within 10 days or something, she got the first letter. So then later that year, in November 92, uh, the Queen set up an organisation called the Way Ahead Group, which is a committee that meets twice a year uh, to deal with major issues facing the royal family. And there's very little doubt that Diana would have been on that agenda of that first meeting and then how to deal with her and, and it was straight after that that uh, the Queen insisted on the two Charles and Diana separating and officially being separate and that was announced in Parliament in December 1992. So that was the first thing and then in 1995 Diana went on uh, uh, national TV from the BBC um, and, and what she would said in the book her version of the book she now actually said on TV in a very much more full on uh, situation than just being a um, unnamed collaborator in a book so this time she was on national TV in an interview saying the same sort of stuff and uh, that you know there were three in our marriage and uh, it was a crowd sort of thing, it was a bit crowded or something like that and, uh, and uh, things like Charles should never become king. So so once again that upset, that was sort of directly at the heart of the royals and it, it upset the Queen and uh, so this time, she, uh, that was in November 95 and this time in December she sent a letter to Diana telling her that her and Charles should get a divorce and that's exactly what happened and in August 96 the divorce went through except that the Queen took her a lot further than just a divorce and she actually divorced her from the royal family it's not just from Charles so she uh, withdrew her HRH title and her Royal Highness title and also um, effectively removed her from the royal family so even though she was the mother of the future King I, I think Basically, once the Queen had done that, and she was outside of, Tyna was outside of the royal circle completely. I mean, she'd already been outside not since the separation, but she was completely outside and uh, a complete free agent. And so if, if she did anything more to upset the royals, then the only way they could deal with it would be something, do something illegal. So when this, when this business happened with Muhammad al Fayed taking William and Harry to Muhammad al Fayed's brother, I think that really, the evidence indicates that 
that actually generated a special meeting of the Waihi group. So the Waihi group was scheduled to meet in September that year. But they actually brought forth the meeting to July. The decision was made um, after Diana had done her major anti landmine inspection, also after the um, acceptance of her holiday of uh, William and Harry to Muhammad, Muhammad Al Fayed's villa. So, anyway, when, whilst at the villa, uh, Dodi also came after a few days. Um, Sun and, and they struck up a very close friendship and that developed very quickly into a relationship after the conclusion of the holiday. Um, so that was another factor then. So you had a build up, a build up of actions by Diana. She was upsetting people in high places. And so I think it's a, it was a combination of the royals that, that they had the special way he group meeting which was held on the 23rd of July 1997, that was three days after the conclusion of that holiday. Um, so it may well be that around that time an order was given. So yeah, the thing with this sort of thing is it's always circumstantial because you're never going to get <laughs> anyone from that way group meeting putting their hand up and saying, yeah, well, she was discussed. There was actually a newspaper article on the 20th of July, three days before the meeting, saying that Diana was top of the agenda at that upcoming way group meeting so there was a leak from the Royal Household that to the paper indicating that Diana was on the agenda so there's every reason to believe that she was the meeting was a special meeting it wasn't the normal way group meeting and it's quite possible that either at that meeting or around that meeting that an order was given to MI6 um, by the senior royals to, um, to eliminate Diana and and that coincided with the with the anti landmine um, operations that she was carrying out as well. So the so the Queen would have had on on board uh, the leaders of the UK, France, and the US, and who at that time I think those Jacques Chirac in France was um, Tony Blair and Ferdinand Bill Clinton in the US. And it's interesting, actually. Um, well, you know, see from the French viewpoint, why would the French? I mean, the French had to absolutely be on board anyway because the whole thing happened in France. Right. So, so why would they support the royal family? They wouldn't. But why would the French support the royal family, the British royal family? They wouldn't. So. So why are the French involved? Well, it's because of the landmines, you know, because the arms are a huge factor in French, you know, for the French government. So that would be why they would get on board. And this, and the same with um, Tony Blair and Bill Clinton. And, and it's interesting with Bill Clinton actually that he, at the time, um, he made an announcement um, <coughs> while Diana was still alive that. The US would be signing an anti landmines treaty, which was going to be, which was set for the 17th of September, which is two and a half weeks after the crash. On uh, the 17th of September, there was a meeting in Oslo, Norway, and, uh, and he had said, he had said that the US would sign the treaty to ban landmines. And yet after Diana died, during that two and a half weeks, Bill Clinton made another statement saying that they had reversed that decision and that the US then would not sign the treaty. So so that's what happened. When the treaty got signed, the US did not sign it. Hmm. And so now I noticed you've also um, done a book, uh, The Documents the Jury Never Saw. So uh, do you think it would have been different if they would have seen what uh, you suggest? Oh, absolutely. It absolutely would have been different. Yeah. There were things that were so important in those documents. They are probably the most um, in some ways the most important documents in the case. Imagine being, being on a jury you're at, at an inquest and you're on the jury and you don't get shown the post-mortem report for the um, person that you're investigating the cause of death. See the post-mortem is all about cause establishing cause of death. That's what a post-mortem is. And so for the jury not to be shown that report, why? Well, why were they not shown it? 
And yeah. Um, yeah. when you when you look into it, the documents, not just the post mortem report, but other surrounding documents from the toxicology of the samples from Diana, it reveals that um, the samples the toxicologist tested were not from Diana. So the toxicologists were told that they were Diana's samples, but they that they weren't from Diana because Diana's body was embalmed in Paris um, before it was transferred over to the UK, and and yet the samples on the postmortem had no embalming fluid in them. And you've actually got there's actually notes from the toxicologist who did the. Uh, who did the testing? Susan Patterson was her name, and she she's got notes there of her contacting um, authorities on uh, on the way post mortem so done and that sort of thing, and she's contacting these people um, to find out whether it's possible to have a um, a body of a blood sample. A body that has been embalmed with a blood sample that has no embalming fluid in it, because she's shocked. She she's been she's she's tested the sample. There's no embalming fluid, and yet she knew Diana had been embalmed. So you know these things. Plus, there was no alcohol in the tested samples either, whereas Diana had been drinking some alcohol at the hotel. So uh, these things just don't add up. So if you were on the jury and you saw that, just that. Without seeing hundreds of other documents, it's just so much information. But if you'd just seen that, he would think you'd have second thoughts, wouldn't you? You know, right. yeah. Think, Why the hell haven't I been shown this post report? You know, well, they would, if they were shown it, then they would have questions because they'd be thinking, well, hang on, this samples don't have a bone for how can that be? Wow. And so now Diana thought, now she, so, so you were saying earlier that she actually thought someone was going to kill her and it would be an accident. Uh, who did she think was going to kill her? Yeah, well, she and her, there's two notes that are re- relevant to this. She, she gave that note I spoke about earlier to her butler. And then she also, in the same month, she had a meeting with her lawyer. It was actually a meeting to do with the marriage. But but at the end of the meeting, she told the lawyer, who was Lord Victor Mishkon, that um, she expected she could die in a car crash, orchestrated car crash. And so um, he actually went home and the next morning he wrote up a note of what she had said. So he thought it was that important. And then he um, got it typed up and then he locked it up in a safe. So there were two notes. It sort of indicates that she was fearful. In the first note, Darrell oh, says her, it actually names her husband. Because mm-hmm. at that time in October 95, he was her husband, and that was Charles she was referring to, Prince Charles. So she thought that he was orchestrating. And then in the note from Mishcon, it was more, it indicated more like the sort of, uh, maybe the establishment of a senior royals. There was no actual name. She didn't name anyone in that one. But when she spoke to people, there were people that she spoke to saying she feared for her life. Um, it was it was sort of MI6. She feared that she'd be done in by MI6, but, but basically on the instructions of, uh, I think, senior royals or, um, or the establishment, that was her fear. She used to call the men in grey suits... Uh, and that was referring to sort of senior members of the royal household. But she she definitely um, feared for her life. And one of the aspects of that was that uh, after the death of Diana and the 31st of August 97, uh, Victor Mishkon uh, went into the police. Um, he, he called up Paul Condon, the... The, uh, well, actually, he, he didn't do it immediately. It was two and a half weeks later. And what happened is, on the 17th of September, 97, so two and a half weeks after the crash, the French went public. With, uh, there'd been a third, a, a second car involved, a white Fiat Uno, and the debris was in the tunnel, and it crashed into the Mercedes. And there was paint from the Fiat Uno on the Mercedes. So they went public with that. They were searching for the 
going to have a white feet in it. Now that was one of the first things that indicated something suspicious, you know, oh there was another car on this, you know, and the people didn't realise that until the police went public with that on the 17th of September, so apparently when Mish kind of heard that, he thought, oh, okay, I've got a letter here, indicate, a note indicating that Diana feared she could be killed in a car crash, and now we've got a second car involved. And so that was too much for him, and he rang up the police commissioner, who Paul conned on, and said, I need to see you. And he was a, Victor Michelin was a leading lawyer, so that wasn't any problem, and he had a meeting either that day or the next day, and, uh, and in that meeting he handed over the note, uh, he had a copy of it, he kept in the safe, but he handed over the note to, um, to, to Paul Condon, and, what happened is, uh, locked that note in the safe. So, he did the opposite to what a police commissioner should have done with the note. I mean, you get a note from someone written in October 1995 in a meeting with her lawyer, um, that says, the lawyer wrote a note up afterwards that says that she's expecting to die in a car crash. And so the commissioner's given this note after she has died on the car crash. Now, if that had been Mrs. Brown down the road, who wrote a note predicting how she would die, and then she ends up dying in that way, um, then that would be enough to launch an investigation, you know. And so instead of... They didn't need to launch an investigation because an investigation was already set up in France but instead of passing this note on to the investigation in France uh, Condon hid it in a safe and it stayed there for six years and John Stevens took over as uh, commissioner in 2000 and he kept it hidden and then in 2003 that's the year that Paul Barrell the butler went public what his note, so the second note and so once he had done that the police were in a very, very difficult situation because they were hanging on to a note, a second note, that said very similar to what was on Paul Bowles' note. Now, that wouldn't be a problem because no one really knew about the police note except they did. And the police knew they knew and the people who knew were Victor Mishcom, who was still alive at that stage, and also there were two other lawyers present at that meeting with Diana and they also knew about the note. And Maggie, uh, Maggie Ray and uh, Sandra Davis, they were lawyers who worked at Mishcon's company, so uh, it wasn't just them. Other people at Mishcon's were also aware that, that, that Mishcon had gone to the police two and a half weeks after the crash with a note. So, so once they all went public, the lawyers at Mishcon's would have been reading the paper and thinking, ah, that's interesting, you know, and then Mishcon actually got in touch with, um, the, with uh, Stevens, the Commissioner of Police, at that time in 2003. So then the police were forced into releasing the note to the coroner, to the British coroner. The French investigation had closed by that stage. And so the uh, British... Uh, Connor was shown and it took them another couple of months they got legal advice the police sought legal advice because they had to work out what their legal situation was because they had suppressed evidence see the police was meant to be about investigating evidence not suppressing it and so the, 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 the very fact that they did suppress the note indicates a cover up you know again yeah they were trying to protect somebody yeah that's right so where do, where do you see this going now I think that really there should be some justice. I mean, there's been no justice so far. I think there's two aspects to it. I suppose one aspect, one part of justice is that people get to know what occurred. I, I think, you know, the, there are a lot of people who believe Diana was murdered. They just don't know exactly how it occurred or what took place. But uh, it's a question of... I'm doing my best to try and publicise that as much as I can. So it's a question of people becoming aware of what occurred. 
But the other aspect of justice is, okay, why can't something judicial occur, you know, that um, corrects the wrongs? Because, I mean, the inquest was so corruptly run uh, by a corrupt um, judge, uh, Scott Baker, and uh, and then the police investigations were completely corrupt as well in both France and the Britain. And so maybe the International Court of Justice um, could carry out some sort of uh, just inquest. I mean, that's the only possibility I can really think of. I, I don't think you could possibly get justice in France or Britain. Uh, so it has to be something international. Um, and maybe it could happen in the future. I, I, I'm not sure whether that's ever going to happen, but it's possible. Um, I think once the Queen dies, that there will be much more pressure from William and Harry to to not just um, have something proper done. Yeah, when when after the Queen dies, you know, and William uh, and Harry, I'd say that we, we put much more pressure will come to bear, I think, because you know, if I was if I was in William's situation, I put myself in this situation. You know, and your mother's died in a suspicious car crash, but it's never really been dealt with. It's never been dealt with, you know, and so. She's a public figure, so you would want the public to know, I think, about how it occurred. He may well have his own suspicions, you know, and Mary might, um, well, they can't say at the stage, but in the future, that things will change once the Queen's gone. And I think um, there'll be a lot of pressure on Charles to uh, to actually... The, the indication is that Charles wasn't directly involved, Um more came from the Queen, possibly Philip, um, but it was very, uh, there's no actual evidence that places Charles um, in the gun room. It's uh, higher up. Now, how do people get a hold of you and how and, and get a hold of your books? Like, uh, what's the best way? Yeah, well, I've got a website, um, which is uh, www.princessdianadeath.com the evidence uh, dot weebly w e b l y dot com and that website has got my contact email address and it's also um, got all the information about the books it's got uh, a lot of other stuff as well a lot of videos and interviews and stuff uh, that I've done over the years and um, also uh, there's a lot of information about the reactions by leading people in the UK and, and towards the books and things like that. So, yeah, there's a lot of stuff on the website. Okay, and we'll we'll actually post all that so people can get to it on the website and the Facebook so people can get in contact with you. Yeah, great. And, yeah, and we appreciate it. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. The mission has been completed. The end! By George, he's got it! It is the end! I'll see you. If you're lying to me, I'll be back. This is Peter of something media. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.